Hi, welcome to Intermolecular Forces, Solids and Liquids. My name is Dr. English. Today we're going to be talking about solution formation, spontaneity, and factors affecting solubility. Specifically, we're going to look at spontaneity, solution formation and chemical reactions, saturated solutions and solubility, factors affecting solubility, specifically solute-solvent interactions, pressure effects, and temperature effects. Spontaneity and solution formation. A spontaneous process occurs without any outside intervention. When the energy of a system decreases, the process is spontaneous. Some spontaneous processes do not involve the movement of a system to a lower energy state. Now, most processes in chemistry, if they're spontaneous, they'll automatically go from high potential energy to a lower potential energy, but some processes don't. In other words, they'll be an endothermic reaction. They'll actually go to a higher energy state. So we do see some spontaneous processes that do that. And we acknowledge that by seeing a positive delta H. In most cases, solution formation is favored by an increase in disorder that accompanies mixing. For example, a mixture of carbon tetrachloride and hexane is less ordered than the two separate liquids. So these molecules together would have a higher entropy than the individual liquids by themselves. Therefore, they spontaneously mix even though the heat of solution is very close to zero. A solution will form unless the solute-solute or solvent-solvent interactions are too strong relative to the solute-solvent interactions. In other words, the forces holding your solute together or the forces holding your solvent together. If they're stronger than the solute-solvent interactions, then mixing will not occur. Some solutions form by physical processes and other by chemical processes. For example, nickel plus hydrochloric acid gives you nickel-2 chloride and hydrogen gas. Note that the chemical formula of the substance being dissolved has changed during this process. Solid nickel has gone to a solution of nickel to chloride. When all the water is removed from the solution, no solid nickel is found as all of the nickel is now an ion form of nickel plus two. Therefore, the dissolution of nickel in hydrochloric acid is a chemical process. We are not going to be able to go back to our original form of solid nickel by evaporating the water. That is why this is classified as a chemical process. By contrast, we can look at solid sodium chloride being added to water to form sodium ions and chloride ions. When the water is removed from the solution by evaporation, solid sodium chloride will reform. Therefore, sodium chloride dissolution is a physical process. As a solid dissolves, a solution forms. This is known as dissolution. So solute gets combined with the solvent to form a solution. The opposite process is known as crystallization, where a solution is separated back into its solute and its solvent. If crystallization and dissolution are in equilibrium with the undissolved solute present, the solution is saturated. In other words, there will be no further increase in the amount of dissolved solute. So in a dynamic equilibrium, some of your solute is always dissolving in solution and some of your solute is recrystallizing to form a solid. Solubility is the amount of solute required to form a saturated solution. A solution with a concentration of dissolved solute that is less than the solubility is said to be unsaturated. So in other words, I could add more solute and it would dissolve into ions. A solution that is said to be super saturated if more solute is dissolved than in a saturated solution. And for a true super saturated solution to occur, this has to be done at higher temperature and all the ions need to remain in solution where none of the solute falls out and forms a solid again. Factors affecting solubility. The tendency of one substance to dissolve in another depends on the nature of the solute, the nature of the solvent, the temperature, and the pressure if you're dealing with a situation with gases. Pairs of liquids that mix in any proportion are said to be miscible. So for example, 
ethanol and water are miscible liquids. In contrast, immiscible liquids do not mix significantly. So an example here would be gasoline and water are immiscible. Intermolecular forces are an important factor. The stronger the attraction between the solute and the solvent molecules, the greater the solubility. Polar liquids tend to dissolve in polar solvents. In this case, favorable dipole-dipole interactions will exist. So consider the solubility of alcohols in water. Water and ethanol are miscible because the broken hydrogen bonds in both pure liquids are reestablished in the mixture. So here I have hydrogen bonds between these two water molecules and another hydrogen bond here but the hydrogen bond that exists right here is between this water molecule and the alcohol group of this ethanol molecule, which is right here. Same thing here. We have a hydrogen bond that exists between this water molecule and the alcohol group that is on this ethanol. It is these alcohol groups that are coming off the ethanol that make it soluble in water because they are able to establish these strong forces of attraction. However, not all alcohols are miscible with water. So the question is, why? The number of carbon atoms in a chain affects the solubility. The greater the number of carbon atoms in the chain, the more the molecule behaves like a hydrocarbon. And we know hydrocarbons are nonpolar molecules. Thus, the more carbon atoms in the alcohol, the lower its solubility in water. So methanol, is miscible in water, and we see it only has one carbon. Propanol is also miscible in water. It will mix with water, and it has three carbons. But as I increase the number of carbons in my chain with the alcohol group coming off the end, I can see the solubility decreasing until I get to the point of octanol, which has eight carbons, still has that alcohol group on the end, but the sheer number of carbons that are involved in the molecule make octanol immiscible. In other words, it will not mix with water. Now let's look at the number of alcohol groups attached to a hydrocarbon. Increasing the number of alcohol groups within a molecule will increase its solubility in water. The greater the number of alcohol groups along the chain, the more solute to water hydrogen bonding that's possible. So out of these three molecules, this hexanol would be the least soluble because we only have one alcohol group. This hexandiol molecule right here would become more soluble because I now have two alcohol groups coming off. Finally, the most soluble would be this molecule over here, this hexantriol, because it has one, two, three alcohol groups coming off the end of it. And I'm not paying close attention to how to name these particular alcohols, or I would have to establish numbers to show where each of these alcohol groups is coming off my hydrocarbon chain. The whole point of showing this particular concept is just to say that this one is going to be my least soluble, and this molecule over here is going to be the most soluble due to the number of alcohol groups present in the molecule. When we talk about solute-solvent interactions, we can use the generalization like dissolves like. Substances with similar intermolecular attractive forces tend to be soluble in one another. The more polar bonds in the molecule, the better it dissolves in a polar solvent. The less polar the molecule, the less likely it is to dissolve in a polar solvent, and the more likely it is to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. And that is a really important point to understand. Now let's talk about pressure effects. The solubility of a gas in a liquid is a function of the pressure of the gas over the solution. Solubilities of solids and liquids are not greatly affected by pressure. With a higher gas pressure, more molecules of gas are close to the surface of the solution and the probability of a gas molecule striking the surface and entering the solution is increased. So the greater the pressure on the gas molecules over the liquid, the more likely those gas molecules will go into the liquid forming a solution. To summarize, the higher the pressure, the greater the solubility. The lower the pressure, the fewer molecules of gas are closer to the surface of the solution and the lower the solubility. 
the solubility of a gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above the solution. The lower the pressure, the fewer the number of gas molecules that are close to the surface of the solution, and the lower the solubility. And if you think about that, that makes sense. If I have high pressure pushing down on gas molecules in a closed system into a liquid, those gas molecules are going to go into the liquid and the solubility of the gas is going to increase. If I decrease that pressure, I have more volume for those gas molecules to occupy. Those gas molecules are going to come out of solution and it's not going to be as soluble. Let's look at the preparation of carbonated soda. Carbonated beverages are bottled under a pressure of carbon dioxide that is greater than one atmosphere. As the bottle is opened, the pressure of the carbon dioxide decreases and the solubility of the CO2 decreases. In other words, as soon as you open this can, this carbon dioxide under pressure is going to come out. Therefore, bubbles of carbon dioxide escape from the solution, and that's what we see when we see soda fizzing. Experience tells us that sugar dissolves better in warm water than in cold water. As temperature increases, the solubility of solids in general increases. That's not always the case because we can see here, for the most part for these ionic compounds, the majority of them, as temperature increases, the solubility is going to increase but there's always exceptions to the rule. Sometimes solubility decreases as temperature increases. And like I said, in the case of sodium sulfate, it's going to decrease while all others are increasing. Experience also tells us that carbonated beverages go flat when they get warm. Gases are less soluble at higher temperatures. So as we see the temperature increasing again, most of these curves are going to increase, but there are situations where solubility decreases as temperature increases, and these are most commonly our molecules on this chart. So hydrogen chloride gas, ammonia gas, sulfur dioxide are all going to decrease in solubility as temperature increases. So what did you learn? We talked about spontaneity. We looked at solution formation and chemical reactions. We talked about saturated solutions and solubility. We looked at different factors affecting solubility, specifically solute-solvent interactions, pressure effects, and temperature effects. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.